The latest Xbox Series X embargo is up and we're able to share a lot more with you now about our experiences with the system. But it's also an opportunity to share some thoughts and reaction to some of the stories that have emerged kind of organically about the system uh, since the press units first made their way out into the wild. So I guess the question is this, can you really heat your flat with an Xbox Series X in this video with the aid of thermal photography, powered raw metrics and such like? You're going to find out. First of all, some thoughts on the Series X itself and its 1TB Seagate storage expansion. Starting with the industrial design, the form factor. There's a quiet revolution in design here, literally. I mean, it really is quiet. Quiet to the point where breaking out uh, the noise meter is an entirely pointless exercise, really, because Xbox Series X's acoustics merge into the background noise of both my living room and indeed my office. I'd say that it's essentially on par, if not better, than Xbox One X, which I'd rate as the current gold standard in acoustics when it comes to console design. Xbox Series X is chewing its way through more power from the mains, as we shall discover, but the form factor, well, this is ensuring that the noise is simply not an issue. But yeah, the size and shape of the box, though, is quite different. But I'd still say it's very much a console. I mean, here's how the Series X fits with my array of enhanced consoles. It's basically the same height as Xbox One X, but somewhat portlier in other dimensions. You can rest the machine vertically or horizontally, and in terms of footprint, I think vertical is the way to go. The hot air rises by its very nature, so there may well be a slight cooling advantage in doing so too. Boot up the machine, and I think I should stress that this is a non-final uh, piece of hardware running a non-final uh, front end. And I think, well, what I like most about the machine is just how snappy it is. You're likely running the same dash on your Xbox One console right now, and I'm sure you'll agree it's already a big improvement. But access to a much faster CPU and a vastly improved storage solution effectively removes the last remaining lag in the system, local side at least. Now I've never been particularly fond of the Xbox front end, but I finally feel I can quickly get to where I need to be, and that's important. But yeah, very Xbox One-like in nature, and pretty much the only difference uh, is in the enhanced video options available, uh, which are supplied courtesy of the HDMI 2.1 display controller. Right now, the dashboard runs at 1080p resolution, tops out at 60 frames per second, even with the console set to 120 hertz mode. This isn't exactly a pristine presentation, and I do hope for improvements further on down the line. Now, 3D imagery in games, using techniques like temporal reconstruction, you can get a really close approximation to native 4K, but you'll note that almost all games that use these techniques still stick to native rendering for UI elements. That's simply because you can't really upscale those effectively with current techniques. Native really is the way to go there. One thing I did want to do, though, I wanted to circle back to talk about storage. Yes, you are getting 802 gigs of usable space, on the SSD versus 781 gigs on Xbox One X. I did speculate that this was down to compression, that maybe the SoC's hardware decompression engines were being put to use. However, Microsoft tells me that the front end has been significantly optimized for Series X, but the hardware blocks aren't being used, they're reserved for the games. Zen 2 is perfectly equipped for carrying out the decompression tasks required while delivering a smoother overall experience. I mean, that's a ton of space saved, especially when the quick resume cache is uh, factored into the equation. You'll also note that since it does not need to house any OS elements, the Seagate 1TB drive plug-in SSD actually delivers 920 gigs of usable space. In performance terms, it's basically a match for the internal drive, and this is by design. Now, I'd still recommend using a SATA SSD for back compact titles, simply because it's cheaper, but in terms of raw performance versus USB options, I carried out the same Modern Warfare transfer test with the plug-in SSD that I did in my last video, and this is where you can see the raw speed differential. Copy from the internal drive to the official plug-in SSD, and you'll see that over 170 gigs of data transfers in 4 minutes 36 seconds, compared to 11 minutes 6 on an external M2 NVMe. Uh, yeah, the SATA drive, 17 and a half minutes transfer time, and the mechanical hard drive there, a lamentable 34 and a half minutes. Remarkable stuff here. 
So beyond that, it's about the software, and suffice to say we don't have much of it. We've covered Dirt 5 and Yakuza Like a Dragon, and we'll be sharing more soon on Gears Tactics and Gears 5, but for the purposes of this piece, I really wanted to get to grips with how powerful and efficient the new wave of consoles are, or not, depending on the results of the test. We have more silicon logic than ever before, married to much higher clocks, and on paper, this is a recipe for a hot, loud machine. But actually, actually that's not the case. I want to kick off first of all by showing power consumption on a super challenging Xbox One X game running on Xbox One X and that is Dead or Alive 6. We've got native 4K rendering mode here, and the GPU is pushed to breaking point. I've captured the game here and synchronized that capture to a camera feed of my wattmeter. Peak power load, 177 watts. That's from a 360 square millimeter piece of silicon on a 16 nanometer fabrication node. So yeah, remember that. Now let's look at Series X titles that we've got so far to see what kind of performance we're getting and how much power is required to deliver that experience. Yakuza Like a Dragon in its 1440p60 normal mode first. And well, look at this. Basically, just 140 to 160 watts. I saw a peak of 172, I think, bringing it more closely into line with the power profile of Xbox One X, but still generally lower. Now, in turn, you can probably imagine, therefore, that heat output from the machine should be broadly similar, if not a bit lower. Codemasters Dirt 5 seems to have a higher overall power requirement when you look at the wattmeter results here, mostly in 160 watt territory, but it can spike to over 170 watts. I actually tried all three performance modes here and got broadly similar results. Uh, yes, even the 120 hertz mode. So there's an interesting question here, and that's pretty simple. If we have a power draw broadly equivalent to Xbox One X, why do we need this piece of industrial design? And why do we need a 315 watt power supply if the machine spends a lot of its time in the 160 to 170 watt range? Well, here's the thing. When you look at Gears 5, this hits and exceeds 200 watts. So clearly there's much more to Series X than meets the eye. Let's put that aside for a couple of moments. You see, first of all, I was curious to check out back compat titles because we can directly compare nigh on identical workloads between One X and Series X and to see what the power draw is. I started with Rise of the Tomb Raider in native 4K mode with a 30 FPS cap. One X spends most of its time at 30 FPS. There are only very minor dips, but we can replicate that workload exactly on Series X. The only difference is that 16 times an isotropic filtering is added into the mix. Clearly, there's a good degree of variance across the run, but Series X is delivering the same experience with no drops to frame rate and with improved texture filtering, typically saving around 20 watts of power into the bargain. And I'd say that's pretty impressive stuff. But here's where things get even more impressive. So in my first Back Compact Series X video, you would have seen how transformative Series X is with games running uh, using an unlocked frame rate. And in Dead or Alive 6, an experience that lurks in a disappointing mid 30s to low 40s, locks to a glorious 60 with a native 4K, thanks to the power of the new silicon. Now let's check out the watt meter comparing the two systems running the exact same game content via Dead or Alive's replay system. Series X is delivering vastly improved performance over Xbox One X and it's doing it at the same or indeed with lower power consumption. Series X never hits the 177 watt peak power consumption that Xbox One X does. I find that fascinating. What we're seeing here is the potent force and efficiency of the 7 nanometer process stacked up against Xbox One X with its 16 nanometer SoC. So we've got a tremendous improvement here in performance per watt, and it's all happening in compatibility mode where the RDNA2 silicon is basically mimicking last gen GCN. But let's go back to Gears 5. Now you might think that it's funny that a patch for an Xbox One X game stresses the Scarlet architecture more than either of our actual Series X titles, but the proof is in the pudding here. Cutscenes can dip beneath 200 watts, but gameplay is usually above that. A significant increase in power consumption over anything else we've tested so far. It's worth remembering here, first of all, that the Coalition's engine is built to scale, as we've seen on PC. 
It employs dynamic resolution scaling to ensure optimal GPU utilization and the Series X build is running at the equivalent of PC's Ultra settings and it's actually beyond that as new Unreal Engine features like software-based real-time ray-traced global illumination are in place. So essentially the GPU is pushed hard at all times and even when it isn't, dynamic resolution scaling ensures that it is. This is the case across the game, both in campaign and in the 120Hz multiplayer. And by the way, in my tests, that really does lock to 120 frames per second throughout. Not bad for a launch title then, and I suspect that as the generation matures, so we'll see utilization of the system increase and more of the capacity of the 315 watt power supply may be required. But with Gears 5, we have a great test case for testing thermals. So here's what I did. I went into the campaign and found a static scene that kept us above 200 watts of power consumption at all times. And here it is. Not too difficult to find, it's literally at the beginning of the game. Just keep this position and we're basically locked to 204 to 206 watts of consumption. Now's the time for us to break out the thermal camera and take some metrics. And those metrics are certainly fascinating. So there's an interesting distribution of temperatures here. You can see that the metal sandwich core of the processor and Southbridge boards are the center of heat here. And 48, 49 degrees Celsius skin temperature on the console, not bad at all. It just kind of feels warm to the touch. The bottom of the unit actually feels cold, especially on the mostly unused optical drive, which is essentially at room temperature. On the rear, the unit is hotter here, but still in the mid 40s mostly. On the rear, the brightest and hottest spot is where I have the one terabyte external drive plugged in, where we hit 48 to 49 degrees Celsius. Now there's been some discussion about how hot the plug-in drive gets, and yeah, I'll talk about that in a bit. Overall though, thus far, clearly Series X is a well-cooled device, cold even in some areas. So how is this done? Well, the thermal photography reveals all. The whole unit is designed to funnel in cool air from the base, take it through the console, then propel it out of the top. The top there, that's the ultimate heat center for the console and it lights up in spectacular style on the thermal camera. Here I noted a maximum of 62 degrees Celsius and yeah, that is hotter than any console test I've ever done before. But remember, Series X is pulling more power than any console I've ever tested before. Put your hand above the exhaust outlet on the top there and you can definitely feel the heat. In common with any console really, you really do need to ensure that hot air can escape. So keeping Series X in an enclosed space is not a good idea. But I'm sure those reports of using Series X to heat your flat must be a tongue in cheek because look, we can tell from the power meter that our peak power consumption is under 210 watts. And yeah, look at any electric heater, they kind of start at 2000 watts, an order of magnitude higher. I suspect it's simply the case that the funneling of heat with Series X in this kind of chimney-like arrangement concentrates it. That may be what's causing the concern when really you're pushing a max of 20 to 30% more heat out than Xbox One X, assuming that the power consumption funnels directly into heat, of course. And yeah, let's continue the heat discussion by looking at the Seagate one terabyte plugging SSD, which has been described as getting hot to the touch. Now I stress this by copying Fallout 4 to and from the SSD for about 20 minutes, a workload that will far exceed what a game is likely to do. So I'd say that overall the performance is solid. Now let's look at the thermals. As I take the drive out of the unit, the hottest part of the SSD, 46 Celsius, warm to the touch, but that's about it, really. My ultimate conclusion then, Xbox Series X is a larger than average console, but it's still a console and its extra size and innovative design are there to handle higher power demands compared to prior console generations, but the point is that the design pays off. The machine is basically silent and the excess heat generation is successfully dealt with. Heat dissipation does require space to actually dissipate into though, that much is obvious. So don't keep Series X or indeed any of your modern-ish consoles in an enclosed space. Going back to power consumption, here's how Xbox One X compares versus Series X in a number of scenarios. Uh, with the console plugged in but not doing anything, basically turned off, it's drawing about half a watt versus anything up to two watts on Xbox One X. Booting up the dash, One X averages out at around 48 and a half watts, 
while Series X surges to 70 watts, then gradually seems to settle down to about 42. Rise of the Tomb Raider's peak consumption with basically the same workload, 151 watts on the new console versus 170 on the old. Dead or Alive 6 with the full force of the extra GPU power and a virtual doubling of performance in some scenarios, Series X is still more efficient, as we've seen. Now, if you're going to run Series X in its instant resume standby mode, that seems to be around 29 to 30 watts for me. Personally, I'll be turning my console off completely. All of these devices around the home in standby mode, it all adds up. So I'd say that Xbox Series X is an efficient box for sure, but I'm not sure I'd want it left idle for days, weeks and years. One further takeaway. 52 RDNA2 compute units at 1.825 GHz, plus the overhead of the Zen 2 CPU cluster. And it's all just drawing 200 to 210 watts of power from the wall. And that's for gaming performance that has been compared to an RTX 2080. I'd say that that's really impressive and bodes well for big Navi. Okay, so that's where I'm going to leave things for now. Still much to share, but the demands on our time right now are huge. So as always, please bear with us. Remember, we're a small outfit here. We don't have any back rooms packed with video editors, script editors or whatever. We do everything. The scheduling is just kind of insane right now and things take time to complete. But of course, please do like, subscribe and share if you enjoyed the work. Ring the bell for instant notifications. And yeah, I'm sure you know all about our Patreon. Support the team more directly if you can. And if that's something you'd like to do, you'll get pristine quality video downloads for your contribution. And that's nice. Well, that's all from me for now. Thanks again for getting us past the 1 million subscriber threshold. And just generally thanks for watching and supporting Digital Foundry.